Welcome to Six Picks Music Club, a music podcast for people who volunteer to pick up the food order so that they can get a drink at the bar while they wait. Welcome back, listener, to Six Picks Music Club. I'm Dave, and with me, as always, are my two best dudes, Jeffro, baby, baby, <laughs> and Russ. How you doing, Dave? <laughs> I'm pretty good, man. I'm pretty good. How are you doing? I'm good. Good week. Good week. Been listening to so much Amy Grant lately. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what an angel. <laughs> yep. Yep. The Christmas album. Yeah, dude. And just and Vince Gill too. What a couple. Power couple. It was all Shania, all Amy Grant, all the time. That was my childhood. Nice to be back in the pod studio with you all. Six Picks Music Club is the music podcast where we pick six songs around a central theme, each of us getting to pick two, and then we all chat about it. So the math gets us to six. This week, our topic is going to be party songs. And as Jeff is such a good playlist party guy, we thought that was appropriate. We're going to do songs to kick the party off and songs to wind it down. But before we get the lights on, before we tap the keg, we got to get the clubhouse open. What's the secret password this week, Jeffro? Magenta Placenta. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Oh, yes. gosh. Magenta Placenta <laughs> is on the menu. Let's open up the door. <laughs> Watch your step. Step lightly. Step lightly. Don't step in it. Don't step in it. Just step over the Magenta Placenta. Come in. Listen. Watch your step, listener. Watch your step. All right. Everybody get in, get in, get in. Before we get going, Jeff, we haven't talked about this yet. Since the last app that we did, you have some exciting news. You want to tell us about it? My wife, as you know, was heavy with papoose, and we made number three. Nice. I mean, she did most of the work, if I'm being honest. But, you know, that was a pretty big news for the break. Nice, man. Congratulations. Congratulations. We're stoked for you. When you say heavy with papoose, it makes me think heavy with papoo. And then you said she did number three. And I'm like, ooh, that's even bigger than a number two. So That must be the magenta <laughs> placenta. That's the number three. I mean, it kind of is. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of placentas, we went the midwife route, but in a hospital. Oh. On the midwife scoreboard, before the baby was born, the medical doctors in the hospital, through ultrasound measurements, were projecting that the baby would weigh 9.6 pounds upon birth. Ooh, that's pretty, pretty big girl. 98th percentile size child. So the midwife was like doing her thing, which is basically like feeling around up there. Like that's what midwives do. She goes, this seems like a normal size baby. I think their projections are wrong. And I was like, sure, lady. <laughs> Medical <laughs> science is getting it wrong. You could tell that with just two fingers up there. <laughs> yeah, I know. I got real like, <laughs> like I was checking it out last night. It's, it felt kind of big to me. Yeah, <laughs> I've done a lot of exploring up there. I don't really know. She could tell. No, I just got, I got real conceited about being a man of science on them. Like I was like, yeah, I'm sure their midwife estimate's superior, but they were way wrong. The medical doctors missed by 19 ounces. That's significant. The baby weighed seven pounds and 15 ounces. Wow. So then we do the whole thing, have baby, and then one of the midwives was like, "Do you want to?" Look at the placenta. And I was like, yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just so I have more grounding for the live track lightning crashes. I want to know what he was <laughs> trying to connect with me about. <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, what does it sound like when it falls to the floor? <laughs> Anyway, so she's showing it to me, and it's really pretty fascinating. This is why they call it the tree of life. It's like a giant disc, and there's veins going through it, but it does look like a tree, which is crazy. you know. And then she pulls up this membrane, the baby's been inside of it, off of the top of the placenta, and I was like, whoa, that is, I've never really gotten an education in placenta, but it's pretty fascinating stuff. And so we were looking at it, and then I was like, back in the... I don't know, 1995, I watched this episode of Real Sex on HBO, 
you know, because I was just a young teenage boy that was trying to see adults naked on TV if I could. But it was about people cooking and eating the placenta. Consuming. Yep. Yeah. And I was like, so is that a real thing? And if so, do you have any... Did you, did you bring your camping stove? <laughs> I was like, yeah, do you have a good recipe for placenta stew? What is the marinade for placenta stew? It looks tough. Get some yeah. pineapple juice. Can you braise it? Do you braise a placenta for like eight hours, like short ribs? Yes, you have to braise and tenderize. Um, I mean, that's the only way. But yeah, I was like, do you have a recipe for placenta stew? You know, being jokes are kind. She goes, you should not ever consume placenta. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I got, I got it. I, I won't. <laughs> By the way, do you have a biohazard bag that I can carry this home in? <laughs> yeah. So I have another friend who they had their baby and they didn't cut the umbilical cord. They left the placenta attached to it. Have you heard about this? It's like named after a flower, and they let it just rot off. It's called a lotus birth. Lotus birth. They let it stay on there until it falls off on its own, and they, they have the baby, and they carry around the placenta in a side little bag or something. Yeah, it's like a little baby catheter. <laughs> so gross. <laughs> like, you go to get pictures with the Easter bunny, and they're like, oh, what a cute baby. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. What's is this? <laughs> it's an alien coming out of that thing. Yeah, it looks like a metal detector made out of shit attached to her. <laughs> <laughs> Did any of you guys ever go into a shared postnatal room? No. No. At the hospital. We had to do that because we were at a very busy hospital and we were actually lucky to only have one other family in our room. Holy shit. But it was a tiny little space with a curtain around it and I had the chair. You guys know the chair. It's like oh, universal yeah. dad sleeping in the, the recliner turns into a bed chair. Yeah. The most uncomfortable surface known to man. It's just skin on vinyl. It's one of those just like <laughs> just sweaty and and they don't like bring you a bottom sheet or like a pillow or anything. No. They're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go raw dog that chair, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're in the in the shared neonatal room, I mean, are you looking over comparing products? What does happen is that you hear all of their issues. And so, like, I don't want to list, Oof. but you're in the same room and there's no unhearing unless you have headphones on. There was another family that it was their f fifth child. Mm. And so there was like some small medical complication that I won't get into. And they were like, you should probably stay an extra day just to be on the safe side. And they were like, we can't because we have four kids waiting at home. Dang. And I was like, oh man, that sucks. I have a cousin who has seven kids and they, they had to like get a panel van to drive the nine of them around because that's, uh, it's just, it's, there's not cars that actually fit that many people. Panel van, you mean like a abuser van? Abuser van. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into it. Let's talk about party songs. I like to entertain. I like to have people over. I like to play music. I mean, I feel like it's the soundtrack of our lives and stuff. And so if you're having people over, it's always cool to be able to DJ a little bit and set the mood that you want to set. There's some intention that goes into kind of a party playlist and, and how you want the night to go. Your favorites what you think other people are going to enjoy, like what's going to keep the mood in the way that you want it. So this week we're going to dive into what that means for each of us and see where it goes. Tell me about your theories on party songs. I'm glad that you asked. The song that I chose is not actually the very first song I would play, but for me, one of the ultimate party songs. Yeah. But my theory is that you come in with a song that's like, I just can only provide examples, but it's like, Dire Straits, Money for Nothing. You have a crescendoing opening song that will get people's hearts pumping. It's dramatic, yeah. So that's why you open, and that could be from any genre. Then when you're in the middle of your in the middle of your set, you should only vacillate between 80s songs that everybody knows and can sing to and 
90s hip hop. If you do anything else, <laughs> you're just sabotaging your party. It's not worth it. Nobody gives a shit about anything else when you're trying to have a good time. <laughs> and then you close with a couple of thoughtful songs that are about endings or about emotions. But that's just at the end. You don't do that in the middle. That's my theory. So you can show your heart a little bit and that you're a real person. You're opening yourself up to your friends that you have and you're saying at the end, hey man, I'm glad we did this. I'm glad we were dancing. You know, it means something. Heck yeah. Why don't you take us in with our first pick? Okay, so my song was released in April 1996. This is the song that for me, when you play this song, and they played it in the middle of our wedding reception set, everybody loses their goddamn mind. Yeah. It's just one of the best songs for a dance party. And it's DJ Cool's Let Me Clear My Throat. So you remember that from the wedding, I hope, Dave, because that's when... That's when the roof lifted off of the place. Like, people were jumping and going nuts. Is that when I tried to thread the needle? I should have remembered that there's no way you would remember my wedding because <laughs> I've ever told you about this, Russ. He was one of my groomsmen, oh, and boy. Dave was fucking obliterated when it was... Like when we were getting ready and we're in like a museum in New Orleans and it's like we're in this disease and pestilence exhibit getting ready to go out. And <laughs> Dave was like, I didn't, dude, no, it wasn't even like that. It was so much fun. Dude. I was over there. He's just like having so much fun. And I was like, oh, my God, he's going to be a fucking mess out there. But Dave is a pro <laughs> and he's an actor. And so when the wedding planner came out and they're like, it's time for you to line up, he was like, where's my mark? And then they were like right there. And he was just like, <laughs> <laughs> he was just like a totem pole all of a sudden. I was like, incredible. Cause he was like swaying around drunk. And then suddenly he just had it. And I was like, okay, cool. And we go out and he nailed it. We did our thing. We got married and then did a second line. And Dave was like, like his clothes were coming <laughs> off. He was dancing so hard in the second line. And then only after that did we have the party where this song featured. That was the funnest wedding I've ever been to. I remember you on the dance floor. I don't know if you remember it. Oh, I definitely remember being on the dance floor. Yeah, it was like jackets were in the air and people were just jumping up and down. It was so good. But I think why this is one of my ultimate party songs is the guys doing the song, the live version is the most popular. There's seven versions of the song, but the live version that we listened to, which is Biz Marquee and Dougie Fresh rocking the mic, they're having a party. Yeah. And they're at a live show and you can hear the audience. Right. And they're like interacting yeah. with them. You have the saxophone riff in the middle that I just think sounds great. That's such a good saxophone riff and it yeah. gets me pumped up to dance on top of the drums. You're listening to a party everybody's going to jump up and down. There's just something about it that's catchy. It makes you want to get out there and crush. So that's my ultimate pump it up song. Yeah. I love like the call and response element to the live version here where it's like, it's such a crowd interactive thing. I think it's the best. I think and if you do it in a party situation, then you are getting the crowd to do it as well. It makes total sense. And they do do the thing where they're like, white people, yeah, yes, black people, all people. And so it's like unifying. They're pumped that everybody's there. This might be the song that gets the cops called at the party. Oh, yeah. And the party's just starting. That sucks. <laughs> then you should play that at the end. <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe so. Well, and to be fair, I think Jeff said that maybe this wasn't exactly like the first song of the party. So you could play the pop-up song first, or you could play it like, I would go like five or six songs in. You could sense when people kind of want to dance. This needs to show up at that time. Well, and you don't want your big crowd pleaser to like happen when there's just like three people there who showed up on time. That makes sense. Makes sense. I love this song. Uh, I, I did love dancing at your wedding. I love dancing at Russ's wedding. I love going to weddings. I have a great time. I had a great time at my wedding. That is kind of a sad thing that uh, there aren't really many weddings left. We went to a wedding in, in California for my wife's cousin in September, and I think that's probably our last wedding that's going to be like that. It was a 
fun fucking wedding. No, because people get divorced and then they'll get back together. It just won't be as fun anymore. I remember being on the second floor of the venue that we were having your reception at and feeling like, are we going to crash through the floor? Like that was that was like what I remember. Cause... Oh, you're, you're talking about the Friday night party. Dang. Maybe I don't remember your wedding reception. Golly. You tried to thread the needle at the Friday night party, which was right. one of the funniest Amazing. things that I've ever seen <laughs> in my entire life. Because <laughs> there are these two little kids who are like grown ass men now, Andrew and Ryan, that were dressed like little B-boys. And they were like real into break dancing and stuff. And so they were like trying out their little break dancing moves that they had, which were soft and lame, but you know, still cute because they were young kids. <laughs> they weren't cute. They were soft and lame because they're fucking kids. They have no moves. And then Dave was like, I can break dance. And so the music's playing, the whole crowd kind of makes a little circle for a moment around Dave. And so it's it was- his moment. <laughs> And he grabbed his foot and tried to jump over that foot with his other foot, but instead (laughs) tripped on his own (laughs) leg and went face first into the ground. And the crowd went wild. Oh, man. Weddings in NOLA, man. That's a that's a tricky that's a tricky one. You got to like you got to pace yourself, as I learned. But Russ. Let's cue you up. What do you got for us tonight? My first song is called Captivate You by Marmosets off their 2014 debut album, The Weird and Wonderful Marmosets. So when I was thinking about party songs, I was thinking back to college because right. that's when I was going to parties, all right? And obviously this song wasn't out when I was in college, but I was thinking about a night in particular. I was in a bad spot. I think I was dealing with relationship troubles and probably stressed out about finals and working probably more than I should. I should have been studying more, but it just kind of how things were working. I just was overwhelmed by life, I'd say. Yeah. I had this like super intense week and I feel like everything was just kind of going wrong. And I had just gotten off work. I was working at a restaurant at the time. It was late and I was exhausted. I just wanted to go home and be away from everybody and everything. Yeah. I get a call from a buddy of ours. Chris Love. Oh, C-Love. Yeah, C-Love, man. And uh, he invites me to a party. And I'm like, fuck no. I am not going to a party. Like, I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to do anything. And he's just fucking persistent. I don't know why. Because he's a good friend. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so finally, like, I, I give in and I go. So we show up to this party. And I'm trying so hard not to have a good time. Because I want to be in that spot. Yeah. You're mad. You're just, yeah. don't laugh. Don't laugh. You're not going to make me laugh. Right. And so, and he knew where my head was that night and, you know, he's older, a little older and he'd already graduated, but he's, he was a pretty empathetic dude. So he was sharing his own experiences and, you know, working to get me out of my rut. And as much as I pushed back that night, I remember he pushed harder. And before I knew it, he was helping me be my most outrageous self, quoting the song. Yeah. And dudes, it turned out to be one of the best fucking parties I went to. I didn't know whose house it was. I still don't know whose house it was. I only probably knew a handful of people, maybe like Jason and maybe one or two other people. I don't even know. But when it was done, I was buzzing around. I fucking knew everybody, which is not my style. It was just the best party. And again, I don't know anybody. I still don't know anybody who was there. But I felt at that night like I knew everyone. You just drank some nail (laughs) polish and poured mustard on your chest. and Oh, God, dude. Sea Love is like one of the most persistent and affable people that you'll ever meet in your life. He's That's just awesome. like the sweetest, God kindest dudes who just won't won't let you go. He's such a sweetheart. I love that guy. Chris Love knew everybody. And if he didn't know them, he thought he knew them well enough to go to their party, even if he wasn't invited. And he brought a bunch of people with him. You have to have people like that to make house parties go. Here's Chris Love for captivating me and bringing the best out of me that night. Anyway, so I guess I was thinking about that. And then I was thinking about the song and it kind of just worked for me. So that's where I went with that. As for the music, man, Marmosets, they're high energy. Totally. At times you're going to get metal, punk, straight rock. They can be hooky. They also have ballads. And Becca McIntyre, the lead vocalist, has got this awesome voice that ranges from soft and sweet to like super vicious and gritty and filled with rage. Not in this song, but in this album, the range is crazy. The album has got like a good variation of pace and tone. It all works together, but the songs are very different from each other. Yeah. No, I got that too. I was listening to other parts of the record and there's like parts that are real math rocky. Yeah. This one feels a little more structured. I was kind of curious to get 
like that instrumental break, do you not consider that to be like a guitar solo? Because it kind of feels like a guitar solo and you don't like guitar solos. So I said I don't listen to a lot of guitar solos. I didn't say okay. I don't listen All right. to them. Yeah. OK. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just I don't go searching <laughs> for epic guitar solos. And generally there's Got an it. epic guitar solo. I'm like, mm, OK, let's skip. Nah. Anyway. Yeah, he just doesn't um, like your guitar solos that you choose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I I read that her vocal cords got all messed up. Did you hear about that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, like all of her screaming and like uh, and and hollering. Band persevered or whatever. I guess they just put out a new record last year. Is that right? No, they put one out in 2018 called "Knowing What You Know Now." It's also great, man. They're both those records are so good. But the music stopped. Like they just stopped making music. They had the baby in 2019. And then in August of 23, they teased a new song, but that was it. And then I don't know what's next for him. So, all right, man. Well, thanks, Russ. That was the first time I'd heard that song. So, that's what you say uh, every week. It's cool. <laughs> and here we are with another song that's brand new to, to me, but uh, it's still rock and roll, man. I love it. When I think about the party song, I think about people walking into a party in a movie, and I feel like this is the song that's playing. And so, this is a song off of the 1997. Wyclef Jean record The Carnival and the song is We Try to Stay Alive. Yeah, dude. Wyclef Jean coming from the Fugees in 1994, a band he started with Praz and friend of the pod, Lauren Hill. They actually started another band called Translator Crew in the late 80s that then went on to become the Fugees. But this was after all that, and he went off and did his solo record, Lauren did her solo record, and he brings in the Refugee All-Stars as well. So John Forte, Praz are on this track. Lauren Hill went on her own. They didn't. She didn't do anything with this record, but they've still performed together as the Fugees later, so there's no animosity there. It kind of uh, combines parts of my theory. The Bee Gees is mixed with hip-hop, and so it's, yeah. it's the best of both worlds. So yeah, the BG sample from Stan Alive blends that hip hop with the disco in this like really danceable, positive way. He does this blend of taking that that BG's positivity, but like entering a bunch of lyrics about the trials of living life as a refugee. You know, he's from Haiti and lived with relatives while his parents moved to New York. He didn't move back with his parents until he was nine. So he has like a real life experience of, of growing up in Haiti and, and, and being a refugee. And actually, there's a line in the song where he talks about other rappers going to college. And he's like, you college boys playing your Ouija boards to write your rhymes yeah. or whatnot. Yeah, so I it's heard just that like line. He's, yeah. he's poking at their authenticity and just like, you know, his stuff's all all lived experience or whatnot. You know, Wyclef Jean thought about running for president of Haiti. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He actually tried to. And he would have won. Yeah, but they got disqualified or something, right? Yeah, because he wasn't, like, officially a resident there. So yeah. it was uh, some residency issues. Also, you have to think that in a place like that, somebody like him would be too popular and they can't let him run because they will mm. lose power. And <laughs> they are definitely not mm. losing power. Oh, man, what a mess that place. It's just over. It's basically been taken over by gangsters. It's kind of like The Purge there right now, the movie. Like The Purge 1 or which Purge? The Forever Purge. The Forever Purge? Yeah, the Forever Purge. Yeah, so this song always takes me back to a, a time in late summer of 1998 when I was in high school and I wasn't the cool, confident person. I'm still not cool. I'm a little more confident, but I was trying to get out of my comfort zone. So I signed up to be on the cheerleading squad. Then these four other dudes signed up to be, and I wasn't friends with any of them. My mom worked for the assistant principal of the school. I was really, really not cool. And that's the summer I learned about anal sex. <laughs> <laughs> it was always a D battery night. <laughs> 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 yeah, but one of these dudes was was really cool and like brought me into the group when we were getting ready for cheerleading like they would play this song and so like it has a a memory of like finally getting into something that was a little out of myself. Dude, I never knew that you were a cheerleader in high school. Yeah, dude. That is senior year. Brilliant. Were you picking them up? Are you picking them up? <laughs> yeah. We did the whole thing. 
We did the towers. We did a lot of yelling through a through a cone. Is that easier than it looks? Because it looks like I wouldn't be able to do it. But what, could I do it? It is not easy. We did not lift them individually. We lifted them as a team. Oh, okay. We were not athletes, the five of us. We were all not on the football team. Yeah, exactly. When you see those like <laughs> big, thickened cheerleading dudes and they just throw the women up and catch them with one hand and they're holding them up, you're right. like, what? Yeah. Come on. Bunch of hunks out there. Just Oh, they're so hunky. A lot of bicep there. I got to circle back to... Uh, circle back, Nickelback. Oh, boy. Not like you said sorry. You're coming on a different story. I don't, I don't even know what the... <laughs> I bit down. I bit down. Bit at the bottom of every bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, oh god. I love the lyric I've been at the bottom of every bottom. Yeah. That's just every bottle. <laughs> no. It is every bottle, but that it is, is funny. every bottle. I was just wouldn't it be funnier if it was I've been to the bottom of every bottom? <laughs> I don't know why that cracks me up so hard. <laughs> well, and reminiscing, this is how you remind uh, me that I've been to the bottom of every bottom. It's just like, it takes me been back. It's to like, the bottom of every bottom. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a pioneer, like a virgin kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. All right, sorry. What um in the we try to stay alive track there is a uh, there's a call back to your song Jeffro where there is. he says, you know, let me clear my throat. Yeah. Your song is so prolific that it's influenced all these other hip hop songs like Beastie Boys reference it. Like it's it's everywhere. Yeah, no, that's a good point and I noticed that when we were listening to it. Chad Kroger is worth 80 million dollars. Jesus. Nickelback's Chad Kroger. Is it Kroger? That's funny. Is it Kroger? I always thought it was Kroger. Kruger? I don't care. Kruger? Oh, you're not the only one who doesn't care. Check out this clip from Loudwire. We are catching up with Chad Kruger, frontman for Nickelback. And it is Kruger, right? Because you know 50% of the internet says Kroger. 50% of the internet says Kruger. Can you okay. confirm? Okay, it's it's Kruger. It's Kruger. Don't, don't, don't trust the internet. Uh... But you never have corrected anybody when they've called you kroger which i always thought was weird i never get time because it goes hey well here we are with chad kroger uh, da, 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 da. so how are things going and by the time it gets it's so far in by the time i get to say something i don't actually because if i just stop and go actually it's it's kroger <laughs> i'm gonna look like such a so i just i'm just like well, I, whatever i don't care you say vagina <laughs> i say vagina <laughs> you say placenta I say magenta, <laughs> magenta, placenta. Midwife says not to eat it. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, that's uh, the song that I picked for my party song. That's a great party song, dude. And I will incorporate this onto party playlist. Wow, my favorite chip. Yeah, what's your favorite chip? Man, it, it's gonna change. So sometimes I'm just gonna go straight corn chips, like or like restaurant, like a Frito tortilla chips. Sorry, because like just mm. for like nachos and stuff. But if I'm just talking like a chips that I'm gonna have with like a sandwich or something, man, sometimes it's sour cream and onion. I think. Yeah, dude, it's oh, a wavy boy. sour cream and onion for me. Oh yeah, crispy, crunchy, a thickens, and uh, yeah, th those are good. You know what? Though I agree with all of what you're saying, all of you chips of both types and i love chips and salsa you know so i like that's the reason i want to go to the mexican restaurant i think those are different i don't consider those chips i mean that's not a chip yeah because you can eat them at a, you can buy them and eat them at home they're chips they're called tortilla chips yeah yeah but they're tortilla chips they're not potato chips we're talking about potato chips or corn oh, chips or something okay. i just think because like i feel like tortilla chips no, just you can do just... so much with them which makes them super great because they're just very versatile yeah and some of my favorite things have uh, tortilla chips underneath them. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. And they're raw and authentic and vulnerable. <laughs> That's just and... called Mexican food. <laughs> <laughs> but, dude, honestly, like crunchy Cheetos are like the uh, best oh, thing that you yeah. could yeah. ever stick in your fucking gob. Okay, so I hate the orange fingers, right? I just can't do it. Oh, I love the orange fingers. Use chopsticks with them. 
<laughs> Dude, that that tells listeners so much about you, what you are. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm over here just like rubbing the Cheeto cheese in my beard so I could have some later. Just <laughs> Dude, they are so fucking good, though. I remember the first time my kids had them, they just looked at me and they're like, are you serious? Like, this exists and you haven't given it to me yet? They are the crunchiest. They're so loud. Yeah. Have you ever been at an event that just opens the bag of Fritos and puts chili and nacho cheese inside of the bag with the spoon? Yeah. Frito pie in a bag. <laughs> not even bothering to put it in like a... A little basket. Yeah, paper basket. We're not even going to fuck around with those. We're just going to dump it right in that bag for you. And then you scoop it out. Mmm. Yeah, they do that also with Doritos and taco meat. And it's called a walking taco. Yes. So it's like taco in a bag. I don't understand why there's an obesity problem in this country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so who's going to intro our wind downs? Russ, why don't you hit us with what your wrap it up song is going to be? My party closer is called Second Act, in parentheses, in credits by Tony Sly off the album 12 Song Program. Tony Sly, man. Tony Sly was the front man for the punk band No Use for a Name. And later in his career, he put out these acoustic solo albums, which are just like him and a guitar. I'm once again not necessarily picking a song that you would play at a party, but I'm just kind of thinking about the party goer, if you will. I don't know. It feels like a beach party to me, right? Yes, the acoustic guitar vibe, I guess you get from a beach party. <laughs> yeah, definitely campfire-y. We're, we're all having a good yeah. time. We've all had some tequila. Like, we're, we're enjoying it. Well, and more than tequila, right? Because he's describing someone who, as Jeff likes to say, is feeling gooey. And he's mentioned things like conversations I won't survive the next day, right? Yeah. And then like one of my favorite lines is, by your side they wait, but you're not coming down. Earth to you, you left them on the ground, right? It's just like so gooey. On the moon. And the song itself sounds uplifting and comforting even, but then there are these like small cracks that start to form in the middle. He's like paranoia and mood swings and like mentions cops, you know, just like these things are like, well, that, OK, that's not necessarily the greatest thing. Right, right. Tony Sly is widely regarded as like a great person. He's super genuine, really nice and just apparently great to be around. But in 2012, he died in a hotel room. There was no official statement, but Fat Mike, who signed No Use for a Name, it was actually the third band that Fat Records signed, wrote in his book, Hepatitis Bathtub, that Tony was recovering from back surgery and mixed his pain meds with booze and just never woke up. Ugh. No Effects even put out a song called I'm So Sorry, Tony, off their first ditch effort album. And if you don't think No Effects can write an emotional song, like, think again, man. That song is... Yeah blisteringly fast at times anyway and then uh, there's just like a shit ton of heart and regret in that song yeah tony sly was 41 when he died so sad man his party's over he like rocked the entire punk community man that was nuts yeah it was nuts but um it's been a little bit since i've had somebody die on the pod so <laughs> did he kill somebody off yeah what i do like about it is the way that he sort of blends that affected persona of the party goer with like a real sing-songy kind of melody and just sort of like if you're not really listening to the lyrics you could think oh yeah this is kind of like we're just hanging out but he's <laughs> getting into like uh, he's talking about some dude who's just totally out of his head yeah <laughs> we've all been there so we're gonna circle back to jeff yeah let's hear about as things start to move into the later part of the evening which way are you going Things start to wind down. People aren't dancing and singing as much anymore. And it becomes a bit more reflective. People are pondering their level of drunkenness. And they're also thinking, like, when are we going to do this again? This is a special time that we have. Some people like me, I guess, reflect on the party that way. Because uh, I'm a person that's always participating and thinking about the whole event at the same time. I don't know if you guys do that. I just think that that time of the evening and during the party i don't know that you're like thinking about like you're not thinking about playing Freebird. you're thinking about like how you're gonna go lay some pipe are you talking about in my former self or my current self well like what are you talking about <laughs> what are you what are you talking about <laughs> asshole i i guess the song that i picked isn't about Oh, now we're transitioning into our D battery night. It was about, 
in which case I would select closer by nine inch nails. Um, <laughs> I didn't know we were going to go just into industrial sport fucking right after the party. <laughs> <laughs> hey great party dude now let's get to the fuck <laughs> yeah let's go fuck yeah so <laughs> i mean maybe that's after this but like i was thinking everybody's <laughs> together and it's kind of a coda it's a it's a terminus it's the end it's a group thing <laughs> you got together and that's a great thing and now it's time to depart what do you want to listen to arcade fires wake up from the 2004 funeral <laughs> given up on the party it's not over it doesn't mean that everybody has to leave at that moment but it is a sending out it's like when the fireworks are going you can sing with it you can do the oh you know and it, and it does crescendo you know he's screaming at some point which i like we're not giving up on our energy but it's towards the end of the night the song structure kind of encapsulates the party pretty well too because it's real high energy like there's the first part of the song i feel like that's the beginning of the party you're like doom, 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 you know and then it gets to that penultimate section and then it it does the reprise and you're watching the fireworks and it's just like yeah what a send-off you don't want to like take it down to zero immediately you you know you're sending people off with a bang right. not with like a meow meow like, that's not what you want to do. <laughs> I think it depends on the party. It depends on the audience. But certainly this one sends people off feeling good. Hell yeah, dude. Well, I am going to slow it down a little bit. I'm going to take us right to the end of the party. Let's close it down. This is a song written by a man named Ronnie Dunn. He's actually the Dunn half of Brooks and Dunn. From their debut record, Brand New Man, in August 1991, the song is Neon Moon. This is just one of the greatest songs of all time. I'm jealous of this pick. Dude, I'm getting flashbacks of Jeff riding in his mom's station wagon. That's right. <laughs> Our Red Cavalier. Dude, that is such a good song. Kicks Brooks is from my hometown, by the way. Kicks Brooks, spelled like... Like the cereal, like the kid's cereal. <laughs> the cereal, yeah. The last time I was in my hometown, I went to the American Legion with my sister and her husband, and the band played that song. And, dude, nice. it just takes the house down. Like, everybody wants to hear that shit, because it is yeah. a drippy, beautifully written song with good lyrics, this one is let's just slow dance let's wind it down it's a heartbreaking song like if you listen to all the lyrics just straight through but just from a party aspect it's a great transish song we're winding down yeah the party and people are moving to the next venue hopefully getting horizontal with a friend this is a sexy song i think for people in their middle age you know you think about like yeah. we're gonna go now we'll go to the part of the evening where we share a bottle of wine and make soft porn like love to each other, you know, gauzy, <laughs> gauzy sex, gauzy lighting on this Gross. sex. And just to like dial in on 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 old Ronnie Dunn for a minute, yeah, he wrote this song before he even met uh oh oh Kicks Brooks. Like he wrote this, yeah, because he had moved to Tulsa after getting kicked out of Abilene Christian University because he was there in the '70s as a psych major while he was playing bass and bands in Abilene. And the university told him he could quit the band or he could quit the university, and he moved to Tulsa. Tulsa, Rock City, by the way, just where everybody goes to, <laughs> yes, really blow it out. Well, he was a country music. It was a good, they had a country scene. They had a good country scene. I know where I'll go. I don't need Abilene no more. I'm going to Tulsa. <laughs> oh. He was like, put up the deuces and moved to Tulsa to find his fame and fortune. But when he did hook up with Kicks, they made their first record, Brand New Man. And the first 
four singles that they released off this record went number one on the Top Country Albums, Billboard, uh, Hot Charts, or whatever. And honestly, just off of merit, nobody knew who the fuck they were. And then suddenly, yeah, I mean, it was all you would hear for a while in that red station right. wagon in the early 90s. Like, they were bumping Brooks and Dunn. Obviously, I'm not a big country stan. I'm not going to sit here and, oh, man, old stuff. But, like... These are just really great songs. Like, these guys can yeah. write fucking songs. They can also write vicious earworms that will drive you crazy like Boot Scoot Boogie. Back then, you know, Garth Brooks had Friends in Low Places. There are these, like, sing-along, yeah. fun. Yeah. They had to have one of those. And then they could give them this glorious, perfectly written song after that. All right. Well, hell yeah, man. That's the party playlist. So if you guys are not ready to go out and rock on your own, don't forget you can hear all those songs in their entirety in the Spotify playlist, in the playlist that is linked in the show notes. So be sure to check it out if you want to hear more. Be sure to like and subscribe Six Picks Music Club wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss out on any of our fun adventures. And uh, yeah, shoot us a comment. Tell us about your party songs at our website. You can email us there at sixpicksmusic.club. Tell us if you thought we sucked or if we were okay or just, you know, that we're here. Been to the bottom of every bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah. Well, so that's going <laughs> to wrap us up today with all of our... <laughs> Fun party songs. We said I've been to the <laughs> top of every bottom. <laughs> Dude, he has to he has to fuck every bottom. He can't He just can't stop. This episode of Six Picks Music Club was produced by any position. <laughs> Edited by Eaton Beaver. <laughs> <laughs> With special thanks, as always, to Dixie Rex.